We have a, a talk today that uh, might be considered slightly controversial. So we want to assure you that is not its intention. About so too many years ago, I was in the city of Jaipur in Rajputana, India, and visited the observatory of the Maharajas of Jaipur. The observatory is one of six ancient structures going back several hundred years. The one in Jaipur, approximately 200 years. It consisted of a whole group of stone, marble, and bronze instruments. There was no telescope, nothing to see the stars with, and the dominating instrument was a sundial 60 feet high of stone. This was not the little garden variety we are familiar with, but a tremendous instrument. And the surface of the inner sides where the shadows were thrown by the sun were all carefully marked and noted down to a fraction of a degree. A magnificent achievement in classical antique astronomy. And the astronomer who had spent a little time in England and spoke very good English was in a particularly gleeful mood. He was practically beside himself with sheer delight. With his stone instruments, he had discovered an error in the British Nautical Almanac. <laughs> now, this is one of those types of occurrences which should bring modesty to the moderns, but it never does. We are quite certain that the world we live in has been properly identified, defined, and examined by the body of modern science. Actually, however, this is not quite true because we have overlooked something that the ancients knew long ago. We may want to deny it. We're not trying to prove to you that it's true, but has it long been held by the people with the stone instruments that the planet is not a thing, it is a being. The planet is alive. Now this might be questioned by the physicist, and yet the physicist is here, and he has depended upon the planet for being here. All things that live in our planetary atmosphere have life and is the source of them, the mysterious globe of which they all come. Is that unalive? Can that which has no life sustain life, bring it forth, bring it to maturity? Can that which has no life within itself regulate the entire structure of the globe and everything that lives upon it? Does this same inanimate thing, can we hold it responsible? isolated as it is in space, as the source of all life for us, and yet have none itself. The ancients could not conceive of such a circumstance. They had to recognize the planet as a living being. The moment we have the planet as what the Kabbalists and Hermitists call the uh, microcosm, then we also have the microcosm of the solar system. And we come to the realization gradually that the solar system is not something wandering about in space, subjected only to physical laws. All physical laws are subjected to something else. Beyond the ordinary ken of the average person, there is a vast invisible. And yet from this invisible, all things come. Therefore, it is not exactly proper to say that the invisible is nothing. It may not be a thing, but it is the source of all things. Therefore, out of that which apparently has no existence, modern intellectualism has tried to pour the vast accumulation of forms of life and laws of life, and ways of life. The ancients had a different viewpoint on this, and I think sometime part of that viewpoint, at least, is going to be justified. We are going to realize 
that the planet is a living entity. That is, it is as a being. And as an entity, it is surrounded by magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields help to sustain the life that is on the planet. And all things living upon the planet are subject to its laws. Only that which is not upon the planet or not visible or physically existing can evade the inevitability of natural law. Well, to go a little further into this type of thinking, we find to the ancients that the planet had an aura. We begin to suspect from studies in Zen and Orientalism that the human body has an aura. And we gradually come to the realization that there is much of similarity between the human body and the planetary body. That both, in a sense, are sustained by the same life both are subject to the same laws, and each has its entire destiny framed into the pattern of the house in which it lives. So we have now a human body with its magnetic field. We have a planet with its magnetic fields. Now, the human magnetic field can have no origin other than from the planet. It is not something separate. It is a not a divided thing, it is a division of one greater thing. Therefore, we all are dependent upon the same energy field for survival. This energy field is in the magnetic field of the planet itself. It has its rules, it has its laws. And the same magnetic field, when it is enclosed within the human body to make the human being alive, is the source of our life. It is what gives us the skill and strength to exist. It helps us to unfold the potentials of ourselves. And every little atom that is within our bodies is dependent upon this great plan just as surely as every human being is dependent upon the great plan of the planet on which we all live. Now, it also happens that there only, can only be one magnetic field but it is infinitely diversified within itself, but never divided. Every human magnetic field is part of the world field. Every magnetic action of the human being is part of a tremendous field of interaction in the planet. Now we come to the problem, we might say, of the psychic fields of the planets at the uh, human bodies and all the different forms of life that exist within the visible can of man. We have a realization at last that the magnetic field of the planet is that which brings us our own personal magnetic field. That all human beings are dependent upon one magnetic power to, to complete the manifestation of their own lives. This magnetic power sustains emotion, it sustains action, and is the final source of generation. There is only this one life, and we all share it. And because we all share it, and because it is all one in substance, the action of every living thing modifies that field. Every individual's contribution to life is either to support or to de tear down the magnetic field of his own body, which by transference becomes a disaster to the magnetic field of the earth. In other words, our own emotions, our own thoughts are in common with others of our kind, but they also all arise from the energy fields of the planet. Now, what is a planet? Well, we have all kinds of definitions for it, but we know really very little about it, actually. The ancient Ayan astronomers of the Far East said that a planet is a fetus. A, a planet is a sun not yet born. Only the suns are born. The planets are all embryos. And they are all tied to their parent sun by a magnetic umbilical cord. And this cord is attached to the north pole of the earth, the magnetic pole. And the excretory system of the pole is the south pole. And energy is moving from the sun through all of these fields of magnetism 
and ensouls the earth with an energy which sustains all the flora and fauna and every living thing, including ourselves. We are all part of this unborn planet, a planet which is going to become born as a sun. And when it is, then it will create its own offspring and progeny, just as in the family of human beings. In nature, everything is generating, and everything that is generated is regenerated. So the planet becomes a kind of a prenatal womb in which a new sun is preparing to manifest itself, is to graduate forward and become a free spirit in the great sidereal atmosphere. Now, as we study this a little further, we come to another interesting point, namely that all forms of life on a planet are like beads strung upon a single thread. They are all part of this magnetic field sustained by it. And when they pass out of physical existence, there is no change in the magnetic structure. It simply means that a body is no longer there to be magnetized, but somewhere else another body has come which will be magnetized. But the magnetic field is the energy which makes all things animate, and it makes all things capable of fulfilling the destiny which is their proper kind and it produces the necessary internal motivations and insights to carry on the process of evolution. So now we come to our little problem of the morning, and that is, as long as the human being is living off of the planetary atmosphere, just as much as he is living off of the harvest of the physical planet, he is bound into an economy. He is made to realize, if he can possibly be converted to the thought, that it is prophecy definitely a part of his plan, that he shall cooperate not only with others of his kind, but with all living things and all laws pertaining to living things. The idea that the human being is different from everything else is one of the most objectionable forms of egotism that exists and it gets the whole world into trouble all of the time. Here we are completely indebted to life for everything, and then we try in our own feeble way to destroy the very life upon which we depend. We neglect the realities in a desperate effort to advance the egotistic systems of our, of our own making. We try as hard as we know to destroy the very source of our own life. So we find interesting things as we go down through the pages of history and through the pages of physical science. There is and always has been a close association between human conduct and the laws of nature. Man does not create natural law, and he cannot change natural law. Where he attempts to break the law, the law breaks him. He is here to live through obedience and through obedience to become absolutely unaware of law. When he doesn't break law, law is love. When he breaks love, love suddenly becomes law. Where there is obedience, there is no pain, no misery, and no destruction. But where self-centeredness causes the individual to disturb his basic relations with the magnetic field of the planet, there will be trouble. Now we just pause for a few moments and study the human side of this matter. Here we are as little beings upon a large planet. We recognize four basic types of life at the present time as evolving on our planet. The first doesn't seem to be evolving much, but we call it the mineral. And we know the mineral does grow, and we know that the mineral does have life, and in recent years, the study of crystals has changed our entire point of view concerning the contribution of minerals and metals and stones to the evolution of mankind. The same energy is locked in them and is useful if understood. The second type is the vegetable kingdom. And the vegetable kingdom is the basic source of our nutrition. It is also the most important of the seed factions in life. 
and all things are seeds except sons that, th that are born. The earth, therefore, is a seed also, just the same as it is a fetus. Then comes the animal kingdom. An animal kingdom is evolving from its own rights and its own core. It has nothing to do with the Darwinian theory whatsoever. The animal kingdom is a major form of evolutionary life, and it is growing up just as the plants and the minerals are. And then the fourth type is humanity. Humanity and this planet has never been an animal, although it has, has passed through states of development which might cause a superficial examination of certain basic traits to bring up this speculation. Man is not a highly evolved anthropoid. Man is a human being and has been a human being for a very long time. But as a human being, he has passed through all stages of life just as he recapitulates, recapitulates the human, animal, vegetable, and mineral uh, forms in the development of the embryo, which passes through all the previous conditions before it comes into birth. But here we have on the planet and in man now a being that we can see man is something quite visible and subject to every type of mood you can think of. He is the most complex organism that we know, which only means that we don't know very much about any of the others. But the human being has sickness, he has pain, he has sorrow, he has lawsuits, he has wealth, poverty, and loss. He has everything you can conceive of. And these all manifest, exist, and develop or are retarded by changes in the magnetic field. So man, as is starting out in life, has this field upon which he is to depend for energy. Now, he can't destroy the field because the field belongs to the planet and in turn belongs to the sun. And the major sun and all its other satellite suns are within the cosmic field. This wonderful great energy field man cannot destroy, but he can destroy his own link with it or break down his own relation with it. The more seriously he breaks this down, the more he becomes a victim of his own corruptions. Therefore, we may say for practical purposes that we are looking at a planet when we look at a human being. For in this human being there are all forms of life, mineral, vegetable, animal, and finally the human spirit itself. This field is subject to innumerable dissonances which we can recognize. We have the fearful person whose energies are completely misused in agitation. We have the self-centered individual whose ambitions divide him from the natural plan. We have the, co the, uh, the conventional misfit who refuses to become uh, a worker in any constructive area. We have all kinds of criminal delinquents, and we have a vast mass of persons who, have just, who drift along do their day's work the best they can. All of this is part of a magnetic field condition. And as we look at the individual, we see various things happening to him. We see that, for instance, at certain periods in life, he may develop an acne, which will dis dis disfigure his face and embarrass him. The world can have an acne also. The world can be rheumatic. It can, it can be uh, dyskeptic. It can do all the things that the human being can do. The planet can get into trouble just as much as we can, but the planet gets into trouble just as the human being gets into trouble because some creature is breaking or disturbing natural law. If we expect to be healthy, we've got to keep the rules right. If we expect the planet to be healthy and provide us with a living for untold generations, we have to treat the planet right. If we do not, we will be in serious trouble. Now, we are suffering at the moment from a bad case of smog. We have had a lot of smog around here. Why? Because of the intensification of industries. Because we have had no thought or no consideration for common sense. The, oh, with all the emphasis upon profit and fame and gain, we have allowed ourselves to create a condition that endangers the atmosphere of the planet. Now, the planet is made to take care of bad atmospheres. All planets are. 
all living structures have to prepare to take care of mistakes or faults or failings within their own structures. But in the case of mankind, we have a deliberate process over a period of centuries of avoiding all of the facts of life. Now, science has become a, a custodian of certain concepts. Science tells us that we don't need to worry about these things because there are no rules. The, the rules, the only rules there are, are physical. And these rules are amoral. They have no consequence of resulting from good or evil. These rules do not care what we do with them. They, we can break them. It no, doesn't mean anything because they have no force or power or reality in themselves. This point of view has allowed us to get about as sick as any uh, evolutionary structure has ever been. We are not aware of the fact that we are part of a world of moral value, and that uh, the great magnetic fields and the uh, various auric fields of energy are all keyed to a moral code. Every principal factor, every substance, every nature in the planet is either used or abused. If it is used, it strengthens. If it is abused, it weakens. And this is a very definite rule, regardless of what anybody thinks. Now, it may be possible to argue that a misuse does not constitute a moral error. In most cases, it does, however. The only possible explanation that is not clearly uh, responsible is ignorance. Well, ignorance was all right when we had to be ignorant. But ignorance is not natural to us any longer. It takes a long kind of special training to become thoroughly ignorant now. We have to make a career out of it. We have to settle down and work on it. And one by one, kill out all of our own common sense and all the things that make value to us in daily living. Because every one of nature's processes are keyed to morality. There is good and bad in all usage. And the good usage is the usage that nature respects, or which automatically supports, defends, and expands nature. Misuse is always a source of trouble. Now, we look back over the last several thousand years of history, and we find a long, terrible, terrifying account of misuse. Now, strangely enough, this misuse is not all due to ignorance. It is to a kind of ignorance, but it's the kind of ignorance we don't even want to talk about. It's the kind of ignorance which no one should really suffer from anymore. But it still dominates human life and dominates the various industrial and economic processes of humanity. It even has gradually infected some of the animal kingdom, but the animal kingdom has not yet developed the great malady of ambition. Now we are here on this planet with a toxic atmosphere. This toxic, toxic atmosphere is making many of our communities difficult to live in. Now why do we have this toxic atmosphere? It is because we have focused all of our attention upon certain projects, projects which in themselves are of no interest whatever to nature. The solar system doesn't care whether we build more electronic plants or not. If we build them and use them wisely, the nature allows it to happen. If we build them and use them unwisely, they destroy themselves because they are at variance with the motion of in infinite and inevitable reality. Therefore, everything that we do should be to find out how to do what will protect us from our own misuses. And this is where we have to come into the problem of nature. Every bit of energy that we misuse is derived from our energy pool. It is the energy of the earth, and it is the energy which the earth finally takes from the sun itself. Everywhere we have rules of usage. Usage which means growth. Usage, which means a better life for all of us. But the individual who expects to enjoy the products of right usage 
must not break the rules. Or if he does, he finds himself picked up and carried along by a chain of retributions which he does not want to face, but which he will have to face. We at the present time have forgotten completely what the human being was supposed to do and be. A study of the invisible magnetic fields of the human body are very important. We can see how the moods and attitudes and convictions of people change the coloration which is a symbol of the psychic energy of that person. We can see what thunder and lightning comes from in the human being, a temper fit. An unpleasant occurrence, a kind of cruel or unkind word, and the magnetic field of the human being changes color. Forms arise in it, vibratory patterns, which become the basis of physical disorders. The individual with the temper fit has already polluted his own atmosphere. He doesn't have to wait for the smog to do it. He does it himself. Every time he goes into a some kind of a mood which is destructive and dangerous to the common good. He has created this mood himself and it is turning about on him. And there's not a little atom, cell, or molecule in his constitution that is not going to suffer from his nasty disposition. Now, we can keep this studying and we can find disease after disease that will arise inevitably through the uh, cor corruption of the energy forces which maintain health. Yet we find it more simple to try and uh, pass over all this lightly. We don't realize, however, that it is also pouring into the planetary body. We've noticed lately, and there's been a considerable emphasis, and it was among ancient peoples also, namely the importance of the purifying of the atmosphere through religious conviction. The nearly all ancient people had rites and ceremonies for purification, for the purification of the body, of the mind, and purification of belief. Also, nearly all religion was aimed at one thing, making the power that be, the powers that be, happy and contented. The moment the individual begins to practice value, this value shows up in his own magnetic field and from that reaches over to become an enrichment of the whole ma magnetic field. Whenever the world produces a great teacher or a great leader or a great idealist, the whole of humanity benefits. The moment the individual corrects his own faults, the whole of humanity benefits. And as the more and more people do this, so the world benefits. Everything depends upon the direction and use of these magnetic forces. And the individual has to control them, and the power that in him that controls them is the power of moral force, the integrity of the person, his unwillingness to compromise his principles. Now we are looking forward to a very good example of the present problem. The world is at a very nasty point in its history. Nearly everything the human being has invented, devised, or publicized has been in some way corrupted. It has been used for exploitation and not for common good. Practically every ideal and motive of the human being is self-centered. And this make, makes a vast amount of difference. Here we have approximately six billion people incarnate at one time. And that amount of misuse of a basic natural energy is bound to have very serious consequences. You cannot break rules that much and that often and not have trouble. And we're proving that right now. We are proving that half or more of the planet is in a state of bordering on war, that the economic condition is terrible, that racial hatreds and animosities are dominating everywhere, and all these things are followed by what? The worst weather we've ever known, of volcanic eruptions, tidal waves, cyclones, and all types of um, malaise, we'll say uh, diseases, epidemics, and all this type of thing. 
these chain reactions are simply set up as centers of infection within the magnetic field of the Earth itself. As a human cre creation today, we are practically enveloped in our own smog. We are infected in something with something we can't see, but it is the disintegration of our idealism, the failure of our hopes, the disappointments that we are facing, and the disillusionments that we have with leadership in every field. We have gradually created a very toxic atmosphere under which we must function. And as this spreads, it spreads not only around us, but within us, because we are all taking our energy from the same pool. And if that pool is corrupted, everyone suffers to a degree. When we destroy the purity of drinking water, we all get sick. When we destroy the purity of the life energy upon which we live, and which is given to us as a means of survival, as we adulterate, pervert, and proselyte on these er in these areas, we get sick. And we're going to get sicker still if we don't stop doing it. Now, this is not a matter, basically, of theology. It is just a matter of right and wrong. And right and wrong are far older than any theological system. It means that the individual has got to clear out a lot of toxin within himself. And this psychic toxin is affecting nearly everyone. It is destroying the average person's sense of values. It is destroying the average person's integrities or cutting them down. It's making all the natural and good things of life more difficult to find or work with simply because we have gradually polluted not only our own bodies, but the air we breathe. We know this physically. No one ever questions it. We know we're in very bad condition. We know that we're in trouble with all the transportation practices. We are corrupting the Earth's atmosphere constantly. And as with all of our knowledge and all of our skills, we do nothing to correct these basic factors. Instead of passing laws against this or rules against that, we have got to sometime face the fact that energy, life, has to be used well and correctly or it will turn and destroy the person who abuses it. Nearly everyone, more or less, abuses life. They abuse the powers that were given to them to help them to grow into wonderful people. A lot of persons say they would be better if it was a better world. Well, as you can reverse this and say it would be a better world if these people did things better. But the fact remains that we are faced with a very serious disturbance, namely the loss of the control of our own actions. We are gradually changing the planet into a cesspool. This is obvious. Is there not some answer to this? Why are we continuing to develop more and more material to dump into the cesspool instead of finding some safer way of just disposing of it? We keep on making all the mistakes, but we do not work on the remedies with any great enthusiasm. The reason why we don't work with the uh, problems more honorably is because to do so would interfere with profit would interfere with the person's ability to be the richest man in the neighborhood. To make the necessary correction, we would have to be honest. And this is the one price the world in general does not want to pay. They want to have the better conditions, but not to pay for it. Now we hear, hear, we hear the smog problem, uh, and we know that it is largely a matter of the of, uh, we'll say, disastrous attitudes within ourselves. Most people are worried, and legitimately so. Most people are confused, frustrated, and mistreated according to their own standards of thinking. Nearly everyone, therefore, is a negative thinker. They are thinking in terms of what's the matter, and they are willing to pay for some sort of help as long as it doesn't mean they have to change their ways themselves. They do not want to change their ways. They want a world that changes 
to meet their desires. This will not happen. There is no way in which the planet can take care of this problem. There is no way in which it can work with the problems with which it has been burdened. If we study the planet in terms of its internal structure, we will find that it is classified and stratified very much like a solar system. It has its own interior structure with all the magnetic uh, adjustments and problems. It has elements within the core which we do not know very much about. But it has a tremendous connection, umbilical cord, tying it to the sun. And it is from the sun that all this energy is finally disseminated through everything, including agriculture. It comes up to us as our food. It comes through to us as everything we do and have. It comes through as our institutions, our schools, our churches, our laboratories, our office buildings. Everything is maintained and stratified and vitalized from the energy field of the planet itself. And therefore, everything that happens uh, on the earth is either in harmony with or disharmonious with the energy uh, standard of ethics. Energy has its own standard of right and wrong. And it, it serves either good or bad. But when it serves bad, it violates its own code and there is disaster. War is an example. Uh, petty politics is another. Inordinate ambition is another. All of these things are against nature. And we are now trying to find ways to correct some of these things. We are saying we must find a solution to war. We must find a way for preventing nations from going to war. We must find ways to even out the life standards of people so that abject poverty does not uh, exist side by side with great wealth. We have to get over our religious intolerances and misunderstandings and realize that we cannot worship our God by hating our neighbor. We have to go over everything that we do and straighten it out. And as we straighten it out, the smog will clear. As we straighten it out, we will discover that the smog is really obscuration. It is the uh, gathering up, as in physical smog, of fumes, of neglected things, of misusages of one kind or another. It is built up of unused wastes that are not properly disposed of. We are not working really now to prevent these wastes. We are working to find some way of disposing of them. The ounce of prevention hasn't come into our mind as yet. But it has to come in, because this is a small planet. We are not one of the big ones, not one of the major ones. We are just a very moderate-sized one, which means we have to take pretty good care of it. It, it is, however, wonderful in some ways. Com imagine that one little ball, only about 8,000 miles in diameter, is able to maintain a population of eight, or 6 to 8 billion people. And we'll be able to take care of even more than that. The seventh billion is on its way. But it will have the power to produce the food. It will have the ability to contain and sustain the problems of twice its present uh, population level. But only if it is done right. We cannot make mistakes forever and never reap a disaster. We, to make the planet provide us with what it can, to make all the natural pr processes work, to have the chemistry, the wood, the uh, art, the, the, all of the different sciences, the religions and cultures, to have these things flourishing constructively, happily and together, we have to change the basic way in which we estimate these things. We're going to have to begin to use, instead of abuse, the resources of the planet. No one is thinking much of that. One of the days we think, it, we think of it, we always say, well, maybe by that time we'll get a spaceship so we can go to a different planet and start over again. We're not really satisfied just to ruin one planet. <laughs> and we'd like to get a chance of the whole solar system. And even that would not take care of the ambitions of some people. But actually, we've got to solve it here. 
because when we solve it, we grow up and become people. The great mystery of humanity is very simple. We've got to learn to work together. We've got to learn to protect each other from each other. We've got to build the understanding and the strength of character and the means to sustain and preserve our survival until the work of the planet is completed. It has its own cycle, and we have our cycle. Our cycle demands that we have to outgrow the planet. And in order to outgrow the planet, we're going to have to do something much better than we've done up to the present time. Now, let's take a little look at the body system here. Supposing we attempt to estimate the fact that there are more cells in the human body than there are human beings on the earth. In fact, there are probably more than there are humans, animals, and plants together. And these all work together under certain laws of uh, organization and integration. Yet one sour note by a person can sicken that whole structure. We tear down a body that should last us more than it does, barring accidents or circumstances beyond control, but we can sicken this body with all its inhabitants, and these little cells, theoretically at least, will not know why. They will not know why they are no longer nourished. They will not know why the energies of life are turned away from them. They will not know why a great disaster, a stroke perhaps, disables the entire body. They will have no understanding of how and why these things happen. But they do happen. And they do affect everyone. And it's this exactly the same thing with the study of the human body. Nine times out of ten, the ailment that affects us physically will begin with some inharmony between ourselves and universal law. In some cases, we don't know what the inharmony is, so we have to take it. But there are things we can do every day to reduce the hazards that result from the unnatural or unreasonable abuse of natural uh, materials. We can work daily a little more wisely, a little more intelligently. You take, for instance, the mineral kingdom. The mineral kingdom is ruled by a magnetic field that is diffused. It is sort of an atmospheric fog that runs through the planet and takes care of the mineral, placing part of a germ of life in each germ of mineral structure. Every mineral has a vibratory note of its own. This is now beginning to be understood, and a new therapy and psychotherapy uh, are developing from the understanding we have of minerals and gems. We've always suspected the vegetable kingdom of being very important. We not only have considered it as a source of nutrition, but also as a use of, of medication. We have gradually studied medical botany, and minds like Paracelsus and Culpeper have done a great deal to prepare herbal and natural remedies. The plant kingdom is governed by an energy that moves from the core of the earth outward. In other words, it radiates. It's an energy from inside the planetary core that radiates more or less equally all over the earth's surface. Where there are impairments, where it cannot function, then we have deserts or, or oceans. But in, even in the oceans, the plant life is still active. The motion of the plant energy is vertical, from within to the circumference. The animal energy circles, the energy field circles the earth, going around it, and passes, therefore, through the spine of the animal in a semi-horizontal position. Uh, gradually, as the animal evolves, it has a tendency uh, to become upright. But then, for the most part, the pure animal energy goes around the earth. In a kind of life, it's like a sower. For all practical purposes, man is an inverted plant with his root in heaven and his body on the earth. But all of these do different directions of energy all work together to produce what will ultimately be uh, the per perfect development of the human being. 
we will have the individual in whom all these energy flows are reconciled and become therefore the basis of the four types of life that we have within human consciousness. All the way along as these energy fields work. We read in the paper of a devastating earthquake and we also read in the fact that there has been another wave of anarchy somewhere on the earth. We have had war and we have had tragedy from the very beginning. And the and very careful statistics have shown that war is simply a disease of the a sort of a, a hysteria of the emotional nature. It is a misuse of the etheric energies by a conscious misdirection of their purpose and work. The energy that is supposed to give us life, give us make us more useful to each other is self-centered. And self-centered energy is wrong to start with. So we have all this prime of problem to try to work out. But we must realize that the stagnation that we are in, where uh, actually our tra transportation is bogged down, uh, all of our institutions are suffering from lack of ethical maturity. We have to realize at this point, that it is necessary to do something to change the basic state of things. It's not going to be enough to redo the curriculum. It's not going to be sufficient to open a new church. It is necessary for us to realize that the energy fields of the earth are honest and that only the honest use of them can prevent misery. The more we use natural resources, for selfish purposes, the sicker the planet is going to get. And the sicker it gets, the more we're going to cry out against heaven for being unkind to us. Actually, we are not here on a matter of kindness or unkindness. We are in this world to learn. We are here to learn how to become in due time the sources of new worlds in space. Evolution says that we've got to grow up. And if we don't grow up, we can never take our place with the constellations which fill the heavenly worlds. We have to grow. We have to learn the lesson. And the more we rebel against it, the more the lesson hurts us. The more we suffer from our own mistakes, the more certainly we are punished for our own ignorance. Now, there's no real reason why the 20th century, coming as it is coming gradually to an end, should try to hide behind uh, the shield of ignorance. We are not that ignorant. We are really perverse for a reason and a purpose. We do not wish to become honest until something makes us choose this as the only possible way out. The problem we have to get rid of uh, will be the self-interest and the self-interest centered upon self-destruction. We seem to feel, and we do feel, that what we want to do, we must do. But the time will come when we will also discover that these things that we feel that we must do, that are not right, we must not do, because they are destroying us. We're going to have to recognize that we either have to be good children, or we're not going to be here. And nature has wiped out many civilizations before this one. The real purpose of all growth is to unfold and enlighten inner living, to become near more and more suitable for the divine destiny for which we were intended. It's interesting to imagine the problem of a flat, small planet where we have just one little ball floating in space and all the responsibilities that we have and all the great projects that we undertake and all the great wars we insist on fighting, all on this little molehill in space. Something that is hardly possible to find with a middle-range telescope uh, is the source of the entire existence that we know of. On this little ball, we are living and dying and having our being. We are building our empires. We are going through all the wonders of a small boy in a sandbox. We are going through all these things when there is without the realization that they have nothing to start with. If we uh, took the values that are on earth at the present time and divided them evenly, 
between the population of the earth. We don't come out with just a few dollars. We have nothing to uh, understand this with. We do not recognize that we are wayfarers on a little ship on a great ocean that there is no problem as to how great we can be. The question is, how can we make the journey on this ship a lovely journey? How can we spend our time growing and being friendly and being kind as we swing through space at thousands of miles a minute? All of the great empires, all of the great monopolies, all of the great combines that we fashion in economically are that ridiculous things. They're like children in a dollhouse. The facts of the matter will always remain that all these ambitions come to the same end, and yet we never seem to grow. Now, why is it that we keep on making the same mistake? Why do we take the energy that we were given to grow with and use it to destroy each other? Why should we miss the gorgeous opportunities that we have of enriching the inner life of the individual. Uh, entities are brought into embodiment on a planet in order to grow. They're here in order to be, to be better, to improve, to make uh, new un unusual spiritual relationships. They're here to grow. They're here to find a garden and leave it a garden. They are not here to find a garden and lead it, leave it a desert. This little planet is so inconsequential that even if an individual could rule it, he wouldn't be ruling anything. <laughs> he would only have a lot of trouble and be few of days. We can't, there's nothing to it. And uh, we just can't realize that nature itself has said, Thou shalt not be ambitious. Nature says this. And yet if you say that today in the business world, you'll be subject to ridicule and persecution. Of course you have to be ambitious. You have to do the things that uh, help to advance uh, this great cause of ours, the industry that we have built up, large, largely to impoverish our natural resources. No one is thinking about what we owe nature. We're all trying to claim what nature owes us. And what it really owes us at the present time is a good spanking. <laughs> and if we try hard enough, we will ultimately get it. So here we have the smog. The smog of our discontent. The smog of our deb debilitated resources the burning up of our timbers, the uh, exhaustion of our coal, the blazing away with our petroleum resources, everything going to waste at full speed, probably on the assumption that we, it'll last long enough for us to get out and then let it all fall on our descendants. Our descendants, on, on the other hand, will probably have their own problems. They don't need ours. What we have to face now is education. We've got to clear the air. We've got to find clear air to breathe, which means we've got to have clear thoughts to think with, that we have to have honest emotions to feel with, and we have to have simple and honest labels to work with. All of the overtones, all the drama, all the great fortunes and so forth are futilities. They are nothing but a group of tiny little creatures believing they're big on a most moderately small planet somewhere on the edge of infinity. There is nothing to it. And there's no reason we shouldn't be happy because the happiness is just as big on a small planet. We are perfectly capable of a very harmonious, useful, pleasant way of life. Nature has intended it to be that way. But when a few individuals get grandiose complexes about things, then everything gets into trouble. So we're now gathering up a kind of Malaysia that we never had before. We're going to psychiatrists to find out what's the matter with us. We're discouraged, we're tired, we're worn out, we're disillusioned. We fear the future, we don't trust our representatives, we don't trust ourselves. 
and we know that our neighbors are out for what we have. So we have absolutely a life that is nothing but a mass of negative <coughs> subjective anxieties which we can call psychic small. It's that we are not able to live in a daily happiness consistent with good health and uh, the pleasantries of daily existence. We have created for ourselves a worry that takes up in the morning and stays with us till we go to sleep, and because we can't sleep, we have to take sleeping pills. All of these things over something that has no substance, no reality. Nature did not intend us to compete. Nature does not demand competition. The idea that it does so demand is purely an interpretation by the individual a phenomena that he does not understand. We are all here to be one more or less contented group living within the means of our creation. The planet is not going to get any bigger. The problems are not going to get any smaller unless we make them smaller. And when we can really go to bed and have a night's sleep without fear and without worry and wake up with a clear head to do the things we really want to do, the smog will begin to clear. It is absolutely impossible to go on with the excesses that are now bothering us. Transportation has become so difficult in many parts of the world that it is practically not possible to get anywhere anymore. A man in the Ukraine well, not long ago is said to have wanted to get a new tire for his car. So to get it, he had to go to a town about 60 miles away. So he told the station matter, master to give him a ticket to this town. And the station master handed him a ticket for 30 miles. Well, he said, I had 60 miles to get to that town to my, get my tire. The station master said, yes, but the line is already 30 miles long and you have to get at the end of it. <laughs> and that is not as much of an exaggeration as it sounds. Everything we are doing is simply blocked. In a few years at the present rate of time, we will not be able to drive a car. We are in the same way in our entertainment field. It is ceasing to entertain. There's barely time enough on the air now between advertisements for a few flashes of some kind of a picture. <laughs> we are completely bogged down. And the only way we can get out of it, first of all, is personally. We get out of it personally by simply not cooperating in any case where we can get away from cooperating. We can not do many of the things that cause this problem. We can be more articulate in demanding what we want. We can be more uh, specific in failing to cooperate or no, no longer being willing to cooperate with things we don't believe. We can gradually make major changes within ourselves and our own smog will begin to clear. We won't worry so much about life if we are not contributing to the worry. And if we get to live a little better ourselves and a little cleaner and a little neater, why, things will improve. Now, several civilizations of the past have made the effort to try this, and so have several great philosophical systems. The effort has been to simplify life. I think probably one of the best efforts was made in this direction was made by Buddhism. It was one of the religions of the world which did not emphasize the importance of success. It made it most important for the individual to see the reality of life in the simple things of daily living. It was the purpose of Buddhism that the individual should gradually relax away from the artificial uh, uh, attachments with which he has become so familiar. The hindrances, as Buddhism calls them. The hindrances of ambition. The hindrances of fear. All these things by means of which we attach ourselves to the burdens of a material existence we have ruined ourselves. There are other faiths and other beliefs that we can use also, but the, uh, the main purpose is to simplify our own personal beliefs and our own way of life so that we do not contribute to these difficult problems that have made such a mess out of our world history for so long. Uh, 
I think then we should definitely get together and say we're going to do something about pollution. Pollution is corruption. But pollution is ruining something. It is taking something that may be in itself decent and right and making it indecent and unright. It is doing things to use various capacities and abilities to advance corruptions. Now take the human mind, for example. We have a mind to think with. Is the computer going to help this any? They will gradually end up without even bothering to think. And yet when we get that far, we're not going to be many betty people. We're not going to have anything but the tail. We're not going to be so wonderful. We just wait a few more years for somebody else to over-invent that. Something else will come. So we give our lives to learning to computerize. And what happens to, to this life within us? What happens to the mind and the heart and the soul? What happens to all the things that we were supposed to do? What happens to the little child that comes into the life of this world? It's a radiant little object of hope to be gradually transformed into a wretch of desires and uh, miseries. What are we doing? Why are we not using our world to make something out of it that we can be proud of? It's there. We have everything we need to do great and beautiful things. Down through the pages of history, we see some mag magnificent souls, great geniuses, great idealists, great servants of humanity, great teachers. Where are they in the textbooks? They're not there. We're not educating people to live better. We're educating people simply to use the mechanisms of a completely materialistic psychology of life. Therefore, we are sick, and we will be sick. Now, it may be that some of us have reached an age where we can't quite go back to school again and learn it over, but we can start where we are now and begin to study into some of these values. There are great ways of advancing knowledge. There are ways of becoming better than we were before. It's something that we can work with every single day. Everyone should have some self-expression. I think the old idea of the gills was very good. In the days of the princes and the paupers, the gills were the workmen organizations that did the hard labor of Europe and built the empires which are now represented by the great palaces and cathedrals. The gillsmen always said you had to have two strings on your bow. And that uh, if you are by some chance a cardinal of the church, you must also be a tradesman. So if you like to, you can be a cardinal and you can also be a horseshoer. You can make the shoes for horses and put them on if necessary. Or you can become a great a scientist of that time, a physicist or something of that kind. And as your sideline, you are a baker, making hot cross rolls for the uh, customers. You are supposed to do two things because you must have variety in life. And the individual with his nose tied into one thing is a danger to himself and everybody else. We have to have variety. And our present mayor wife penalizes variety. It tells us we must stay with the one job until we are too old to do it. If by chance we get so rich we don't have to do it, we still haven't learned the second trade and have nothing to do but waste what we do have. There, is, uh, there are rules that can be d taken out. There's some wonderful rules out of the past for teaching people to think now and to think straight and to get rid of all these pressures and, pa and miseries that are afflicting so many of them. We are all under the ban of this pressure. So we watch. We are watching the weather right now. We have told how unseasonal it is, how the cro crops of the Middle West are being devastated by drought. And on the other side of the world, bombings, explosions, fighting, everywhere arguing and struggling, and everywhere a deep psychic dis disharmony. We call it smog if we can. A great fear, 
A great anxiety is resting upon the face of mankind. We are fearing the worst, not because some angry deity is going to do it to us, but because we haven't sense enough not to hurt each other. The time has come when these things have to be changed, because if this smog continues in our own soul, we will find the atmosphere of the earth may be so polluted that humanity can no longer function here. Because fear and anxiety are a form of pollution. They will destroy the life of a human being if they don't give into it too deeply. And they can destroy the life of a planet. This planet is really a lovely thing. It is a gorgeous little bubble floating in space. One of the most magnificent mysteries that we ever attempted to solve, and we're probably not going to solve it right away. But it is a solvable mystery. And we are always adventuring into the wonders of this world. Here's a chance to grow in palm harmony with nature. Why not grow with it instead of against it? Why not bring to the study of life a living interest? Why change it all into a laboratory experience? Why be so constantly concerned with cells and atoms and so forth and forget the wonders of a world of realities about which we know literally nothing? All that world that is behind the veil of ideals is unknown to most people. We live only in the commonplace, and yet the commonplace is only the shell of a magnificent mystery. It's time now to begin to think about some of these things, to get our minds above the smog level. They say if you get up six, seven thousand feet, you can get away from the worst smog. If we can get our minds up six or seven inches, we might become happier and more healthy people. We've got to get above the problem. And to get above the problem, we've got to live above it and think above it. We cannot brush the smog away with a machine. We have to change our way of life until we are harmless. And when we are a harmless creation, we will never have these problems to worry about. We will no longer have the problems of our abuse of animals, our abuse of human beings. We will never be sacrificing dreams and hopes and aspirations aspiration for a few cents profit. These things belong to a way of life that was primitive, aboriginal, savage. And it goes on and on. War is a savagery which have long gone been, have been overcome. There's no reason for these things. There's no need for them. There's just the fact that the individual doesn't try to use the powers with which he has been endowed. I think one of the most fortunate things we notice now is more and more people are turning in search of value, searching for something beyond what they have known before. Something will answer some of their questions. But here again is a problem, because most of these people are not prepared to know an answer when they see it. They are not able or, un, or are still unable to select those things which are real from the various opportunities that are being uh, expressed at the moment. Many of the most no noble and beautiful of these opportunities are still uncertain, and we have the personal value and the personal knowledge to solve them. How a great human family can have come down through the ages to the 20th century and not be able to discern integrity, not be able to me measure or face honesty, and not to know what truth is when they see it. These things must be corrected. There's no need for them to go on like this forever. They can't go on forever. Unless we do something about it, we're all going to be the loser. We hope desperately and definitely that the new century is going to bring us a lot of answers. I think it will. There's a new way of life coming. The gradual revolt against stupidity is taking momentum. <laughs> now, one thing we have to realize is that when these changes come, there may be a few discomfitures. The individual who has been living entirely in false patterns will probably be disconcerted for a time. But we must also learn to face change as the most important thing in the world. We must learn new things. We must learn to transcend our old beliefs and our old concepts 
and find better ways of approaching the serious problems of life. We need better families, better education for children, a better understanding to the growing young person going out into life. We need more young people who go out with dedications instead of simply desperate efforts to get rich. We don't need a lot of this flamboyant so-called superficiality with which we try to cover the miseries that we have. Beneath all this grandeur that we now have is an eternal abiding misery because we have built it upon a plague-ridden foundation. When we get it down right to where it belongs, when we get solid ground under our feet, we can build wonderful worlds, worlds of beauty and truth and hope. We can be friends. We can know that our families are safe, that our children can go out without danger. For all these dangers and all these problems have come from individuals, one way or another, who have never recognized the natural purpose of life. The, the real reality, which has to finally take over, has not been properly taught or experienced. There is no reason in the world why a people as far advanced as humanity is today cannot solve its problems. It does not solve them because it doesn't know that they are problems. They assume it's just an inevitable fact that we'd be miserable forever. This is not an inevitable fact. This is an inevitable result of a very grave misunderstanding of values. We can clear the atmosphere, clean up our own lives, and build very wonderful new foundations quite easily if we really give it a little thought. One of the things we probably shall have to give a little more intent thought to is also the very simple but very inevitable and very transcendent meaning of love. With all things where there is sincerity, there is growth. Where sincerity is hazarded, the, great, the greatest of all dangers comes to us. False affections, false emotions have sustained most of the miseries of history. But when unselfishly, kindly, and gently we love one another, we really honestly want to see each other succeed and grow and become better. If we would have a real warm spot in our heart for that which is true, and a great delight in those things which are simple, ordinary, commonplace, but in a way the greatest artistry of all. If we can begin to build some depth into our civilizations, we will be much happier. And we can get rid of this air smog. Because smog is, is some, another name for greed. It's another name for personal ambition. It's a name for corruption and dissipation. It is whatever is the, against a clean world and a good humanity. And the time has come when the, the, we are beginning to have to divide the sheep from the goats. There is a, a situation coming in which individuals will either have to improve or face hardships and pains and sufferings which they did not need to face at all. It is now time to get to work and clear the air. They're going to have to pass some rules on smog, there's no doubt about that, but everyone will find some way of avoiding or evading the rules. But when we finally come to the point where there is no more any way of evading, the smog in our own hearts will clear. The uncertainties which we have allowed to accumulate will gradually fade away. And the antagonisms we have built on the basis of ambitions and competition will have no longer any meaning. Then we will be what we were in the first place and always will be when it comes right down to the facts of things, very likable human beings who are getting each other and themselves into a lot of trouble over nothing. We're allowing things to happen that should never have happened simply because we didn't realize the importance of a constructively planned life. But these things are coming home to us as never before, and I think they will continue. And by the end of the present century, I think we'll be much further on than we are at the present time. We notice in several places where these changes are beginning. We notice that... Uh, the great power, the great tremendous driving from promise of materialism has become a definite failure. 
we are finding religion sneaking back into practically every political system of the world because there's no way of having good people without good ideals. A mechanistic civilization can never be great or permanent because everywhere we look, we see an infinite misery and mystery, a tremendous grasp of spaces which no materialist can really understand. We have tried materialism as a means of solving the, the mysteries of superstition and we have resulted with a materialistic superstition that is the most dangerous of all. We need religion, uh, we need truth, and we need love, we need friendship, and we need kindness. And with these the air is clears. With these also we have economy of living. We will no longer be in a position where we are constantly jealous of somebody else's possessions. All of these things are not worthy of human beings, but we have tolerated them too long. And for that matter, here is this little ball going through the air, air at a tremendous rate of speed. A little wall, world of itself. We hope it will last a while yet, probably will. But we are, here we are out here, sort of half shipwrecked. And uh, for a few years we live here. And we make all this mess out of it. Why not just simply face it as it is? A pleasant trip with a good deal of friendship, a little hard work, a great deal of hope, and a love of study and improvement, and a simple acceptance that it is all part of a divine plan. And when we realize that, we can settle down and be human beings again, instead of all these transcendent giants who have which are nothing but midgets in disguise. <laughs> when we get this thought a little bit better fixed, I think the smog will clear not only on the outside, but the inside. Get rid of it in ourselves, and you'll find the air on the outside will get much worth, more worthwhile to breathe. And we won't all have to go around studying and stammering with headaches and heartaches as we have been in recent years. So uh, if when it comes to smog, let the clearing of smog begin with us. And if we do that, we'll all get along better. No, that's it.